All right, so gonna jump into chapter 11, digestive system, and we will see a little bit of overlap here um, with the upper airway. Uh, some of the things we talked about with the respiratory system in chapter five and the upper airway, we will be um, also mentioning sort of in chapter 11. And then of course the esophagus we mentioned in the neonatal section in chapter nine. Here we speak a little bit more about the esophagus. And a couple other things like the gallbladder, which we've, we've mentioned before, and the pancreas and the spleen, the immunity system. So a few, a few areas of overlap. Basically, I think everyone knows what the digestive tract does or the digestive system. We eat, put food into our mouth, and it goes through our body and comes out the other end digested. And along the way, it is pulling, the body is pulling the nutrients and the calories for energy all the stuff that our body needs, it's pulling it out of that food that we've put into ourselves. And then everything that's not used and that's not necessary continues to be compressed and consolidated until, again, it's wasted or excreted. And so we go from, you know, as, as external as the lips and the tongue and the teeth, all the way to the rectum and then to the anus where it's excreted. And so there's a whole lot that goes on in between those and so that's what we're going to see in this chapter summarize then that pathway we have ingestion into the mouth digestion which is breaking down that food then we have absorption which is absorbing that food so we get what we need and then elimination or excretion out of the body these pictures are on 456 and 457 of your text so i would uh, encourage you guys to turn there keep an eye on these pictures as we go through the next couple of slides starting at the top we're we're at the mouth and then inside the mouth we kind of learned this with the respiratory system you've got the palate which is the term that includes both the soft palate and the hard palate so when we say the palate it's including both of those but the palate is just the roof of your mouth and in the roof of your mouth if you tap on it like that near your teeth, it's hard. You can't push on it, it doesn't have much flexibility. But the further back you go, one, you'll start gagging, so don't recommend you do this. But as you start moving further back, it becomes softer and softer and more flexible. That is the soft palate. And you can see on the bottom picture of 457, there's really not a distinguishing line between the hard palate and the soft palate. It's sort of a gradual reduction in rigidity until it becomes the soft palate and it becomes flexible. That flexibility allows it to move and wobble a little bit, which helps to be controlled by some muscle tone and helps us to move the food in the area that we needed to move. We needed to move to the esophagus and away from the trachea so that it goes down the right tube. And then we have the uvula, which is again in that picture there on 457. It's that hangy ball thing in the back of your throat when you open up your mouth and look at it that hangs off of the soft palate. So it's sort of like part of the soft palate and it really is just there to direct food. It could be considered unnecessary. There's some patients who have obstructive sleep apnea that they've just got so much stuff in the back of their throat. Some of it's due to being overweight. Some of it's due to being just a small anatomy and um, maybe having a larger tongue and just the way that the palate is grows, it might extend further back. And so then that causes some obstruction when you're trying to breathe, when you sleep at night and everything relaxes. They actually have, they have uvula ectomies, which are crazy to think about, like going back there and snipping that thing off. They, they'll even go further and they'll take part of the soft palate. And they'll, so they'll call it a pallido uvula or sometimes uvulo palatal ectomy in which they'll excise part of that out in order just to create more room in the back of the throat for that patient. Excruciating. I don't know if you've ever had oral surgery of any type before, but like it's, it's bad. Like I cut my finger the other day and like that's really, it's inconvenient because everything I do touches my finger. I remember watching an episode of House one day and this, you know, young 20 sort of like stoner image kid came in and he's like, my body hurts everywhere. And he's like, if I touch here, ah, it hurts. And if I touch my leg, ah, my head, ah. And so then Dr. House was assessing him and, he, and then he grabs his finger and the kid goes, ah, <laughs> because the kid's finger hurt and not his body. But everywhere he touched, it hurt because his finger was hurting, right? So that's kind of like the, the deal with the, your finger, like everything hurts from that. But imagine having your mouth, like, you, everything you drink, everything you eat, trying to just speak, and just having that constant irritation in the back of your throat, I think it would be excruciating. Horror story set aside, that is the mouth. 
Um, of course, the tongue, um, major muscle in our body, probably gets used more than just about any other muscle, maybe not more than the heart, but we're always constantly um, running our tongues and moving them. But they are extremely important for moving food around and chewing it and making sure then how it, the, the food goes back and forth between the teeth that need to chew it so that it gets chewed effectively. And so that then when it gets swallowed, and again, the tongue is helping to direct that as well, that uh, it's at a proper size to be digested. The pharynx can be broken up into several categories. We have the nasopharynx, which is if you just point straight behind your nose, like straight back, not up following your nostril, but straight back. That would be the nasopharynx back in this part of your head. And then down just about an inch is the back of your mouth. And that would be your oropharynx. And then go down a little bit further and then you're getting into the larynx area, which is around your vocal cords and then the esophagus. And of course the esophagus here we see about a 10 inch tube. So depending on your height, of course it's gonna be longer or shorter, but approximately 10 inches or just a little bit less than a ruler in length. And that is what gets the food from your mouth to your stomach. They include the term here peristalsis, which is something that you'll hear a lot in the hospital um, in, when you're reading medical records of uh, GI and intestinal conditions because it relates to how the intestines contract the musculature within the, the intestines to move the food through it. And so when we look at this picture on page 456, we see the stomach and then connecting to the small intestine, which is the big bundle in the middle, and then the large intestine, which kind of makes a frame around the small intestine. In order for food to travel through all of that intestine, you know, several, you know, 20 some feet of intestine, there's got to be muscle tone and that muscle tone squeezes. And, and it, if it's in succession, so if this is part of my intestine, it's going to be like squeeze, 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 squeeze. And it's just going to do this over and over until the food stuff finally makes its way through the canal and then out of the body. And so peristalsis is just the term that is used to relate to that. Uh, once we get past the esophagus, then we're looking at the stomach. We kind of just blow by the esophagus, but there's a lot that goes on in the esophagus medical wise. Lots of cancers, especially from smokers that get esophageal cancer. But then there's of course bile and stomach acid that gets regurgitated. And that regurgitation into the esophagus can wreak havoc on the person's esophagus. It can cause cancers itself or it can actually erode through the esophagus, causing fistulas or hemorrhages and abscesses. So you'll see, you know, you see all of the sort of stomach acid relief medications on TV for that type of reason, especially if you lay down. Oftentimes regurgitation is, is easier to happen than sitting up. So we don't want to just blow by the esophagus and say that there's not much medical need or use terminology-wise for it. You'll actually see a lot of procedures based around the esophagus. But once we get to the bottom of the esophagus, then of course we're at the stomach and there's a little opening or a sphincter at the end of the esophagus, the esophageal sphincter right before the stomach starts. And that's there to help keep food from regurgitating. However, it can become stretched out. It can become just non-effective or incapable. And that also then is gonna allow more regurgitation. The fundus, we saw the fundus of the bladder as well. So the fundus is kind of a, a term that can be used in multiple situations, but it's just a domed portion of any hollow bladder. And you could, you could actually call the stomach a type of bladder or a vesicle indeed, but the fundus is that area of it that's just the rounded sort of top part. Pylorus is the lower part and it's a sphincter as well. So it's a muscular stricture that is then controlling how long the food stays in the stomach before it passes into the small intestine. It's got to stay in the stomach long enough to be digested well enough before the intestines can do with it what it needs to do. If it doesn't work well, this pyloric sphincter, then we get larger foodstuffs that have not been digested and broken down by the bile and the stomach acid. And those can cause bowel obstructions inside of our patients. And that can be a major problem as well. So the pylorus or the pyloric sphincter would be considered in, to be in the antrum or the distal portion of the stomach. And then the main portion of the stomach is just called the body of the stomach. So then the small intestine, and again, if we're looking at page 456 at this uh, picture, we see the stomach sitting sort of to the right, as we're looking at it, to the right on your patient's left of the liver and just tucked underneath the liver a little bit. 
and then it kind of goes and disappears. It, it runs underneath the large intestine or the colon, the transverse section of the colon. Then it's just all of these little squiggles, right? It looks like sausage down there. That's your small intestine, and it is the longest in your body, but it's, it's approximately 20 feet long. It runs from the end of your stomach to the cecum of the large intestine or the colon. Like we've mentioned before, its main component is digestion. And so that's where digestion sort of ends is within the small intestine. So it's the longest because it's going to do that. But then it also has an absorption component as well. Of the small intestine, it's made up of three different sections, the duodenum. Some people say duodenum or duodenum. Um, I always pronounce it as duodenum or the ju jejunum or jejunum uh, and then the ileum. And it just is first, second and third portion of the intestine the ileum being the largest portion of that. And I, I try to remember this because of the first letters of the initial of the words, so D, J, I. So once we get through the small intestine, then we're looking at the large intestine, which is only approximately about five feet long, um, but it's formed up of three major parts, and its main role is absorption. The three major parts are going to be the ascending colon, which if you're looking at that picture on 456, it's that portion on the left. So it's the portion that actually connects to the lower small intestine, but then goes up the body. And then it goes across the body. That's the traverse or transverse colon. And then the last portion is going back down the descending colon before it reaches the anus. And so those are the major portions. Um, the cecum is just the very beginning of the large intestine. Colon is oftentimes what we just refer to the entire large intestine as the colon, um, even though it has three separate parts of the colon. And then of course the rectum and the anus uh, is just the very distal end of that. And so we see this here as the cecum just being this very small uh, portion and then the ileum coming from the small intestine. So this is all your small intestine, all your sausage rolls up in here. And then it dumps into the colon right here, right above the appendix travels up the ascending, across the tra um, transverse, and then down the descending, and then it goes into the sigmoid, and then the rectum and the anus. That is the, the sort of best way to overview the stomach. If you look at, pay, I'm not sure, the stomach, the intestines, if you look at 461, it kind of gives you a walkthrough with arrows pointing down of here's how food travels through your digestive tract. Mouth, yeah, pharynx, sort of upper, and then esophagus, stomach, small intestine, large intestine, anus. Like if you kind of just break it down into those large categories, and then as you can remember that and just repeat that via memory, okay, mouth, esophagus, stomach, small intestine, large intestine, anus, then start breaking it down to, okay, well, what's the aspects of the mouth that are important? Then say, okay, mouth, you know, teeth, saliva, tongue, palates, pharynx, then go to esophagus and start labeling the different aspects of the esophagus, then to the stomach. But just do it in steps like that, sort of like from gross anatomy down to microanatomy in order so that you really understand the pathway. And then as you get better at understanding the pathway, then you can understand these little things like, okay, well, what do the salivary glands do? And why is saliva important? Why are teeth important? Well, teeth emaciate the food. It chews it up. And then saliva gets in there and it starts breaking down the food. Digestion begins in your mouth. Like that might be weird to think about because everyone thinks about digestion with sort of like farting and pooping, but digestion starts in your mouth with chewing and saliva and salivating. And then it continues on into your stomach with the bile that's produced by the liver and stored, uh, stored in your gallbladder. And then it helps to pump that into the stomach as well as into the intestine in order to help break down fats. And so we can continue to sort of get smaller and smaller through that. We can talk about the gall, gallbladder and the pancreas, which we've discussed in previous sections. But again, they play a, a major role in the digestive system. A few other structures, peritoneum. Uh, remember we talked about the pleural lining of the lungs, and then we talked about the pericardial lining of the heart. Well, the peritoneum is just a sac lining of the abdominal and pelvic components. We, when we say the peritoneal cavity or the peritoneal space, that's just like your abdominal 
cavity or your abdominal space. And the peritoneum is that sac lining. The inner lining of the peritoneum is called your visceral peritoneum. And then you have the parietal peritoneal lining, which is the outer lining that is against your abdom abdomen and not against the organs themselves. But again, that just allows for smooth movement of all of your abdominal content so that when we're jogging and running and when our food is being mulched up by our digestion, it's not causing us pain because it's rubbing against other parts of our body. The appendix, we saw this in that previous picture right at the very end of the, or sorry, the very beginning of the large intestine or the colon, right part of the cecum, right here, the appendix. That you always hear about appendicitis or appendectomies. So it's a very, very common procedure that you'll see in the hospitals. It's often thought to have absolutely no function whatsoever, and, and that might be true. There's been some papers put out in some literature saying, well, there actually is like an immune function to it, or it's got this function or that function. Truth is, we're just fine without it. But I do believe it does have some function. I, I wouldn't go as far as saying that it has completely no function, but it's not, it's not essential to life, obviously. So here we've, we've kind of already looked at this pathway of food overview. Um, so I, I really like this graphic. I think the text did well in including it. And then, of course, we've been looking at these pictures the whole time. All right, uh, that's perfect timing. That brings us to where we're going to start talking about terminology of uh, Chapter 11 in the digestive system and the combining forms. And if we kind of look through a few of these, as we continue to prepare for next week, we can see a lot of these words like stom, well, stomato, um, oro, mouth and stomach, jejun, jejunum, ilio, ilium, gastro, gastric, seek, cecum. It kind of makes sense as long as you know sort of the, the gross anatomy of digestive system. So continue to look through that, uh, 458 and 459, um, talk about these organs. And then that leads right into this chart of combining forms, which is on page 461. We're looking at surgical terms built from word parts, page 464, the combining forms of the digestive tract. And most of these are, are should be um, fairly familiar after looking at um, some of the word parts and the, are the different organs of the system. Actually, page 461, I correct myself there, where we're at. As far as this slide is listed, you can see that um, on the table on page 461. And we had, we had finished going through sort of the, the pathway of the digestive system, starting with the mouth, esophagus, into the stomach, and then into the small intestine, which is broken down into the DJI, which is the duodenum, jejunum, and ileum. And then from there, it goes into the large intestine, or commonly known as the colon, which starts off with the cecum, which is just really the entrance to it, and then the ascending colon, the transverse colon, and then the descending colon into the sigmoid colon, which connects the large intestine to the um, rectum, and then, of course, to the anus. So we just finished that. Um, so a lot of these terms are, are pretty familiar. We see like the seek and seco and col, colono, duodeno, entero, esophago, a lot of these terms that are are really familiar to us as far as just the anatomical structures of the digestive system. So that's where most of those terms are coming from and should be fairly straightforward as far as identifying them um, to the different parts of the body. Uh, and then we look at those some combining forms. Now we're over on page 464 and looking at uh, a couple other terms that are commonly used. And so here we're now looking at sort of like the appendix, chylo, which is kind of a, a unique term, but it means lip. And you wouldn't really typically think of the lip as part of the digestive system, but this is where they, you know, they kind of chose to, to put it in there because it is part of the mouth, uh, which is part of the digestive system. Then a lot of the col words like coli, cholangio, so the gallbladder and the vessels around the gallbladder and the duct around the gallbladder. Diverticulo is a term and there's a picture of it there on page 464, you can see here on your screen. Your intestine, your colon, the large intestine, has these out pockets of um, the intestinal tissue on it. And they're called your diverticulum. And they're normal within the colon, but it's a very common issue for food to, and to get stuck up inside of these little pockets and then just to get stuck there and not move around. And then those get infected because that feces just gets stuck inside of that diverticulum. 
And then that leads to a diverticulitis, which oftentimes requires a surgical intervention in order to remove it. A lot of the other terms are fairly straightforward. Gingivo, so like gingivitis, everyone's pretty much heard of that. Glosso, meaning tongue. Also linguo, meaning tongue. So think of like the glossary in the back of the textbook or linguistics, like language. All of those words um, share the same root, and that's why we also refer that to the tongue, because it's obviously ideal, are dedicated for speech. Hepato, so back to the liver. Herni, about hernias. We talked about palato and the palate last week a little bit. Pancreas, polyps, and so on and so forth down the line. So lots of different items there. Some of these ones down here at the bottom are a little bit unusual. Pylor, we know that's like the pyloric sphincter or pylorus. Cial or sial is for like the salivary gland and then steato would be a fat and then uvula of course the uvula in the the back of the pharynx. Uh, we mentioned hernias and here's a, a picture of different types of hernias that's out of your text. You hear about a hiatal hernia pretty frequently where part of the esophagus actually pops up through the diaphragm into the thoracic cavity. Inguinal hernias are mainly in males. You do see them sometimes in females, but uh, mostly in males. And that's where part of the intestine pops through the inguinal canal and down out of the peritoneum. And then the umbilical, which we saw in the neonatal section where the baby can actually have part of their intestines pop out of the umbilicus. You can also see this in, in pregnancy as well, where you start stretching the peritoneum out. And so then it becomes much thinner and because you've sort of got a natural weak spot in your umbilicus to begin with from birth, um, it is a spot where sometimes uh, mothers can have an umbilical hernia as well. But that's not all. Um, you know, sometimes males get it as well, usually if they've got a, a distended abdomen or if they're obese or pretty much overweight, then a lot of times you're getting a lot of extra pressure pushing on those intestines and sometimes they can get an umbilical hernia as well. Some prefixes that are listed, hemi, course, meaning half, such as hemisphere, pepsia, so, um, leading to digestion. So we hear the like peptic, peptic ulcers. Uh, we hear a lot about that on TV because a lot of the medications used to treat the ulcers, which is really, really high in um, rate. Some disease and disorder terms uh, built from word parts. So now we're looking over on page like 468. So we're gonna be, of course, looking at different organs of the digestive system. And so what we're seeing here makes a lot of sense in that. We see appendicitis, inflammation of the, of the appendix, and then a lot of these coles, again, for the gallbladder, not to be confused with colitis. So these coles are all gallbladder, but then colitis is the large intestine or the colon. So just kind of make sure you don't um, you know, breeze over some of these words too fast and that you make that connection because they do sound a lot alike when you read them or say them. And we talked about the, the diverticulum and esophagitis, gastritis, so esophagus, and then gast, gastro, all doing with the stomach, and then ginger, again, the gums, and gloss for the tongue. Uh, here's a picture, again, from your text about basically what gallstones look like. Up here, uh, the screen organ is your gallbladder. And that is, that is, you know, where the bile is being collected and ready to be pumped out then when it's needed. Sometimes that gall can sit in there and uh, become hard, hardened, and create these stones. And then depending on the size of the stone and then which vessel they end up going through, it can cause major issues. So you can take a look at this on ultrasound and see stones within the gallbladder. And then typically, if they're big enough, they'll get caught in the cystic duct. And that can cause some major issues because then it stops all flow out of the gallbladder. And then also the common bile duct, if it gets caught there, it causes a major problem because then you've got basically all of your flow coming down from the small bile ducts and the cystic duct, and it's not gonna be able to get out then and dump back into the duodenum. And so what you end up getting then is this really angry gallbladder because it gets infected and inflamed. And so it really starts to cause a lot of pain in that right lower or you know, right upper quadrant of your abdomen, kind of right below your rib cage. And we'll actually have 
radiating pain is a common sign up to the shoulder blades on this. So that's a really common sign of someone who's got some cholecystitis. And sometimes it will pass. Sometimes you can do like a manual manipulation or massage of the gallbladder and sometimes get those to pass. Otherwise, it's going to most likely cause a, like a surgical removal at some point in order to get that to clear. So it can be a, a pretty severe issue and, of course, can lead to major infections and sepsis, things like that, if, if it's not taken care of. But usually the pain is such that someone's going to go in and get seen for it. Also, it tends to be fairly genetic. So if you've got family members that have had gallbladder issues, then it's likely that you've you probably will as well. And it's not, gall stones are not the only thing that can cause a cholecystitis, but also like really fatty intake of diet can cause an issue as well as just a crazy stressful life. So if you're going through trauma or marital issues, parental issues, you name it, it's causing a huge deal of stress on you. Oftentimes that can lead to a temporary cholecystitis, which is not due to an infection, but just inflamed due to that stress. Okay, so continuing then with a few other disease terms that are built from word parts, hepatitis, again, going back to the liver and inflammation and hepatoma, we know oma is that cancerous or malignant pre, uh, suffix um, added to the combining form in order to indicate some type of cancer. Um, palato, palatitis, so again, the palate, the hard palate, soft palate of your mouth, pancreas, peritoneum, itis. Uh, the recto seal, we saw that seal several times before, and recto would just be meaning that the rectum and the sort of the herniation of the rectum. Um, and then I think we've used all of these other terms already. We just, on the other page, we saw the steato and the sialith, so I'm not going to continue over those. Some terms not built from word parts. Here's where a little bit more commonality comes in, where you see like terms like celiac disease, referring to the stomach, and Crohn's disease, just overall problem with the digestive system. And so a few of these you just hear a little bit more often because they're kind of out there in the mainstream media and you hear about them a lot. Uh, cirrhosis, typically regarding to the liver, and uh, GERD is probably the most common one that's on this list. So acronym as well, but gastroesophageal reflux disease. Hemorrhoids, also just kind of like that inflamed and enlarged blood vessels that get swollen and then will either be inside the anus or sometimes be external to the anus as well. And then this second one here to the bottom, hemochromatosis, is one that you, know, you probably wouldn't you know, be able to understand necessarily. There are some word parts in there, but it's, it's an iron issue with the blood and digestion. It kind of falls into one of those categories where there are some word parts in there, but may not necessarily lead you to exactly what it is you're talking about. Simply look from looking at it. Continuing on with not built from word parts, an ileus would just be a description of a blockage of your intestines. So anytime you have an, a bowel obstruction, you'd basically have an ileus in that it's non-mechanical. Usually it's like a soft tissue and caused by peristalsis or the, I'm sorry, the lack of peristalsis. So remember we said peristalsis is just the natural squeezing of the intestine muscles to move food stuff through them. If that fails, then we usually end up with an ileus. And sometimes that ends up needing to remove a, a chunk of bowel and then join the two pieces back together again um, in order to take that ileus or that non-functioning part of the bowel out. Irritable bowel syndrome, I think everyone's heard of that just because it tends to be one of those slapstick comedy types of things you see in movies all the time. Everyone's talking about irritable bowel syndrome, which I don't know why that kind of stuff is funny, but I guess most people think it is. Um, and then terms like obesity, ulcers, colitis, again, just an inflammation of the colon that's due to ulcers inside of the inside the colon itself so you can kind of get an idea from some of these words like peptic and polyp and vulvu obviously there's some word terms there that can help you give you an idea of where these words are are going with their definition some common sites for ulcers of course gastric ulcers are very very common and often lead to major issues because of the esophageal reflux and just overall upset irritation are from the stomach. Duodenal or you know the upper portion, remember that's like that first 10 inches of the small intestine, common to have ulcers there. 
um, as well as you can get them further down. But usually the common sites are sort of the upper gastric, so stomach, and then the duodenum. Looking at some surgical terms, again, nothing really new here. I kind of feel like I'm repeating myself over and over from week to week or day to day now because we're seeing all these plasties, ectomies, raphies. Um, so here, chelorapha, you know, like a, a suturing of the lip, um, which is usually not a digestive issue, but because someone got punched in the face or fell down and hit a table when they're learning how to walk. This is common with toddlers and things, kids out on the playgrounds tripping and things like that. Otherwise, you know, appendectomy, that's all, that's all pretty straightforward and, and common. Cholecystectomy, so appendix or the gallbladder being removed. Sometimes you see both of those moved, removed at the same time. It just kind of depends on what the issue is and what the surgeon sees once they get down into there. Colectomy, again, back to the colon, so just referring to the large intestine in general, not specific to any specific region, so ascending, transverse, or descending, but just in the colon itself. And then colostomy, placing that hole or that entrance point into the colon. Gastroesophageo, again, just common. We're just sort of like changing the name of the organ that we're dealing with and then the suffix of whatever the procedure is, either cutting into it or excising it or creating a hole into it so that we can access it. Gastroplasty, gastrostomy, again, stomach, gingivectomy, removing some tissue of the gums, glossoraphy, suturing the tongue, again, usually trauma-based, someone bites their tongue super hard, gets punched in the face, some type of, you know, motor vehicle accident, something like that, or seizures, if patients seize and then they bite down on their tongue, can cause a laceration of the tongue in which they would have to suture it. And then, you know, just moving down, hernia, hernia, so suturing of the hernia, ileostomy, excising of the, that ileum, laparotomy, pallido, poly, so again, polyps, palate, pylorus, uh, remember the pylorus sphincter, that distal portion of the stomach right before it leads to the small intestine. And then uvula, um, we see these words down here at the bottom, including this really, really crazy one down here at the bottom, which just, just say UPPP. Instead, he's trying to say that uvulopalatopharyngeoplasty is a mouthful and it, it'll take you a while to get that one down. But that's what I was talking about last week when obstructive sleep apnea patients need to have the palate and the uvula like excised or cut out, surgically removed in order to make some more room in the back of their throat because they're obstructing at, at night. So here's a picture of a PEG tube. Really, the one here on your right is the actual picture of the peg tube. Obviously, the one on the left is just an artist rendition of one. The peg tubes, you can see they've got this balloon down on the bottom of it. That's the part that's going to be inside of the intestine, wherever you happen to place it. And so the balloon would be deflated while you're inserting it. And then once it's in, you know, this is your abdominal wall. And then once you get it into the stomach, then you're going to inflate this balloon so that it can't just easily be pulled back out. So that balloon kind of works as a plug or a stopper in order to not let it get pulled back out. Um, and you'll size these according to your child or, you know, ad adults sizing in order so that it's not sliding back and forth between the two stops. And you can, of course, adjust those as well. But um, that's, that's basically what a G-tube looks like or an intestinal tube in order to provide tube feedings straight to either the gastric, so stomach, or to the small intestine. And here's a slide showing two of those sites. So in ileostomy, this is a site going into the ileum. So this is where we would actually, we'd be putting food stuff and tube feedings into the ileostomy. This would be similar to a gastric tube or a G-tube. This would be called a PEG tube, but Again, it's the same type of thing. This is for food going in. The colostomy over here on the right, if you look at the placement of it, it's way over here at the end of the descending colon. So we know that it goes mouth, esophagus, stomach, then it goes small intestine, DJI, and then it goes to the large intestine, ascending, transverse, and then descending. So this is basically like the last stop for our train, right, right before the rectum. In patients who have rectal cancer or something like that, or there's just some issue where the anus or the rectum, the sigmoid colon, 
there's a problem with what goes between here and then out of the body, they will put a stoma site, okay, or a stomy, so a colostomy, they will open up a site from the outside of the abdomen into the end of the descending colon, and then this will be attached to some type of drainage bag. And so you might hear what's called a colostomy bag. So a colostomy bag is then how the patient gets all of their excrement out of their body. It goes into the colostomy bag, and then they will dump that colostomy bag, and then it fills back up. They dump it, you know, dump it again, and, and so on and so forth. But that's basically their going to the bathroom, is that they've got this colostomy bag instead of um, actually excreting feces. Pictures here of a colonoscopy and a polypectomy. So you can see that picture on the left, they're actually going through the anus with the endoscope or the colonoscope in order to f go in and do an examination looking for cancers. If there's any bleeding in the stool, they'll go down and, and then look for, you know, what's the cause of that bleeding? Is it an ulcer or is it there a tumor? Whatever the case, they're going to go and, and try to find out what that is. And so... That's what they're doing here with the scope on the left. And then once they find, okay, for in this example, they're finding some polyps. So they're going to go in and lice those polyps off using this snare. So they're basically just going around it and then pulling the, the noose really tight around it, which is going to excise that polyp. And then they'll be able to test that to see if it's cancerous or not. Most polyps are not cancerous, but it's always proper, of course, to test them to make sure. Looking at some surgical terms, and these are not built from word products uh, or word parts. So we've, again, we see this abdominal perineal resection, which um, we've, we've seen a couple times now. Anastomosis, which if you look on page 84, um, on the left-hand column, you'll see some examples of what anastomoses look like. And there's three different types there. You can see like the end-to-end -end where they would cut a middle section out and then join the two ends together. The end to side where maybe you would get rid of um, a portion, but then you would take what's left or the good part and then you would connect that into a different part of bowel in order so that it was still useful, but then you just got rid of all of the junk bowel. And then the side to side as well, sort of like marrying two together. And it doesn't have to be bowel. You can do this with different vessels. For example, if you're going to need like chronic dialysis where they're going to take the blood out of your body, filter it, and then put it back in. Oftentimes they'll do, they'll take your artery and vein in your forearm and they'll join the two of those together. They'll do an anastomosis there in order to have a huge vessel that they can go in and out of consistently when they're doing dialysis. It makes it much easier for that, is that recurrence. Bariatric surgery, if you look at your text on page 45, you can see several common types of bariatric surgeries. And this is a very common thing that we see in the hospital with America especially, but we, you know, we are overweight and have an obesity issue. It's not just America though anymore, the more and more um, westernized sort of Eastern cultures get and the more populated they get, the worse their diet has become. And we're starting to see even, even the obesity thing kind of head east into China and Korea and, and places like that as well. So it's, it's a worldwide issue, and so you've got tons of bariatric surgeries that are taking place. So you can see a few of these, um, like this top one, the row and Y. You're actually stapling the stomach, like two-thirds of the stomach you're stapling off, and you're just leaving the very top portion of it as your gastric pouch. So that is then going to give you that sensation of, oh, like my stomach's full, because you've basically cut off two-thirds of your stomach from being used, and therefore you will feel fuller sooner, and then hopefully that means you stop eating, and then slowly your body, hopefully with some lifestyle changes and exercise, will work out all of the extra weight. You can see there in that picture, though, then how do we connect to the intestine? Well, they actually bring part of the small intestine then up to the stomach above that pouch line, so that food can go straight from, the esoph or straight from the esophagus into that little gastric pouch so it doesn't sit there for long, but then into the small intestine. Then it starts being digested and absorbed through there. Uh, you can see similar banding method there in the middle, that vertical banding where, again, you still have this really small stomach pouch, just a slightly, it's a vertical method rather than a horizontal um, stapling, but then it, the stomach 
essentially then the, the top of the stomach is like then connected back down to the bottom of the stomach so food can pass directly from that small pouch down into the small intestine, still using the pyloric sphincter. So there are differences in this and difference in how your patient's going to react and what will be more successful for them. So all that depends on, of course, what their anatomy is, what their psyche is in a lot of cases. And these surgeries often go way beyond just the physical. And then the bottom one, you probably have heard of that one quite a bit, the like just laparoscopic or gastric banding procedure. Sometimes they, you can see here, they have this subcutaneous port where they can actually change the, the size of this band based off of the patient and how they're progressing or regressing. Other times they'll just place a, a certain band that's there and it's not going to have an external component to it therefore it's not going to be adjustable either. Diagnostic imaging, cholangiogram, cholangiography again back to looking at your patient's cholecyst or the gallbladder. So lots of ultrasound going into the digestive system especially regarding the gallbladder. Esophagrams, CT colonographies, endoscopies, so here again, we see all kinds of scopes, colon and endo, esophagy, esophagogastroduodeno. So again, esophagus, stomach, and duodenum. So the very top portion of the small intestine. So we can get down pretty far with the scope from the top. And likewise, we can go pretty far up with the scope from the bottom. Um, and all of that is, is pretty common. Again, gastro, stomach, lapro, uh, stomach, peritoneum, procto, uh, meaning the, the anus or the rectum, and sigmoid, of course, uh, that spot between the descending portion of the large intestine or the colon before the rectum is the sigmoid. So that's what that's looking at. Here's a couple of actual images from a colonoscopy. And so you can see that they're listed there, like A is what your normal colon should look like. B is diverticulitis or diverticulosis issue where you've got some of that food stuff that's chunked up and stuck into a diverticulum causing issues. C, showing a polyp right there. Uh, if you can kind of see where my mouse is, is hovering over there, that's a polyp that would need to be excised. And then D, you can see this little chunk right up here of colon cancer as well as just notice sort of how like red and angry the rest of this tissue is around this cancerous tumor. So colitis um, taking place here as well when normally a nice healthy colon. Yeah, you're gonna have the red, you're gonna see the vessels and, the, and everything moving through, but uh, normally it's gonna be that sort of nice orangish, pinkish type of color and not this just angry hot sauce type of look to it. Some other diagnostic terms not built from word parts and we've looked at a lot of these over the the chapters. Some of them give us a clue, like barium enema. We know what enema means just kind of from common usage. Barium would be using a radio tagged solution to do the enema in order then to see what the, the full scope of what that is going to look like. And if you go to page 492, you can see the result of a barium enema. This barium was placed obviously through the rectum and then pushed up into the patient and so you can see the colon the large intestine really really well but then it's even being retrograde flow up into the small intestine as well into the ileus and possibly part of the uh, jejunum there as well so that's kind of what that barium enema looks like that's also a good example of what like nuclear medicine looks like when we take and and tag something that's going to show up on fluoroscopy or x-ray really well. Similarly, there figure 1119 just below that one of the barium enema on page 492 is showing that ERCP that's listed on your screen in going in to look at the gallbladder as well as the pancreas in order to diagnose issues there. So a lot of times you'd be looking at gallstone issues and, and going in to look to see what it exactly is the problem between the gallbladder and the pancreas, knowing that the gallbladder is and the pancreas are, are sharing bile back and forth and then dropping it down into the intestine. And here's an image of that. Interestingly enough, you can kind of see above the scope here, there's these little white dashes. Those would be right here, I'll circle them. Those are staples. 
typically those are staples. So whatever's going on, that patient had some type of procedure, possibly a cholecystectomy in the past, and now there's some other type of issue and maybe they're going in to look at the pancreas. And so now when you go in and look at this, you can actually see the staples that were left from the previous procedure. That's typically what those are whenever you see those. Some more diagnostic terms, laboratory, terminology usually is regarding to either the test itself or to some type of pathogen that we're dealing with. So here you see the helicobacteria, the pylori, the H. pylori. And again, we use these abbreviations a lot of time when we're talking about these organisms and pathogens because these words end up being hard to say and really, really take a long time to write out if you're going to write everything out all of the time. So here an antibodies test for the H. pylori just to see if you've got antibodies for this type of infection. And then a fecal occult blood test or an FOBT. Again, we'll see that in the acronym section, but looking, testing your feces to see if there's blood in your feces. And when blood makes its way out of the digestive system, it's gonna come out in, in one of two ways. One bright red, as it's like an active bleed that's close to the surface or close to the exit point, or you've got a bleeding that's taking place deeper in the intestines or that was bleeding but now is not bleeding anymore. And this could be because you swallowed a bunch of blood or it could be because you got some type of bleed either intermittently or actively in your intestines. And then that's gonna come out as this like really dark black or almost brown feces. A lot of times patients won't even know that they've got blood in their stool until it gets tested. And sometimes it's a lot and sometimes it's a little. Something like a hemorrhoid though, like if you get irritated hemorrhoids or if you've got an ulcer that's close to the exit point or, a, or like a colorectal cancer or something like that, that type of blood is going to be like a fresh bright red blood that is because you've got a fresh bleed. Typically, anytime there's blood in the stool, it's, I mean, it's very common, but it's one of those warning signs that, hey, something's going on in your body that shouldn't be going on. And you don't want to just freak out because you see some bright red blood in, in the toilet after you've had a bowel movement. But if it's not because, like, one, maybe it was a very large bowel movement and it was painful, that would be an expectation. Two, if you know you've got hemorrhoids, then you're probably going to know that like, they're irritated, they're inflamed. It's common for this to happen. But if it's not like one of those, okay, like, yeah, this is a known thing. If it's new, then you probably should get that checked out because th that blood is coming from somewhere and you do not want to let that go unchecked. The other thing about fecal blood, if you have a GI bleed, especially if it's an upper GI bleed, Oftentimes they are just rank and fetid in scent. And so it's one of those, un unfortunately it's one of those things that you can smell as soon as you step off the elevator onto the hospital floor, you can smell if someone's got a GI bleed or not. It is absolutely rank. And it's one of the things that working in the hospital, you have to get used to because it's just like, you have to almost mentally prepare yourself to work in that environment because the smell is so awful. No, no like, no downers on the healthcare environment, you know, but that is one of like, be real. That's one of the things that, that definitely you have to deal with as a healthcare provider. And there's, you know, that's not alone. There's several others as well, but you know, there's good and there's bad. Most, most days the good far outweighs the bad though. Some complementary terms, uh, built from word parts. So again, here, these are just sort of like on the side terms that relate to the digestive system. And things here that we're seeing like abdominal, anal, okay, that's pretty obvious what's going on there. Aphagia, remember phagia is dealing with swallowing, so A would be inability to swallow, similar to dysphagia or in incompetent swallowing. Colorectal, again, rectum and colon, same thing, you know, duodenal, and we just kind of continue to go on, esophageal, gastro, ileo, all terms that we've seen previously. It's just being used in a, in a different suffix, if you will, in order to identify what they're actually talking about. And continuing on through this list again, we've seen these words from the very beginning, so we, we have an idea of what, they, what they're for. Complementary terms not built from word parts. This is kind of a, a couple pages over, but skip over to 499. 
and take a look at that image of the guy on the right. It's so it shows an ascites patient and ascites. If you remember, this is the abdominal fluid um, in the peritoneal cavity, and so a lot of times you'll see these really over distended bellies, and they're really hard or firm because they're full of fluid. And so this is fluid that's not inside of the intestine. It's not in your stomach. It's not in your GI tract of any of any of any rate but it's just free fluid inside the, abdom inside the abdomen. This is where you would see an abdominal centesis. So we've talked about different centesis before. Remember, that means drawing out of. So we talked about like a pleural centesis, pericardial centesis, amniocentesis. Well, an abdominocentesis would be draining that ascites or that abdominal peritoneal free fluid out of the body. This is different than when we talked about peritoneal dialysis. Peritoneal dialysis is we're purposely putting in a dilute into the peritoneal cavity in order to absorb all of the excess waste that the patient's unable to filter out with their kidneys. And then we drain it, remove it, and refill it. Um, this is similar, but this is a naturally occurring fluid collection that's taking place. And oftentimes it'll need to be drained. And you can pull several liters of fluid out of someone's peritoneum. And it's crazy to see them like before versus after um, the draining. So looking at a few of these other word, word parts, dysentery, so just like a bowel inflammation or intestinal inflammation, emesis, meaning vomit or to throw up, feces, of course, your, your bowel movements or your foodstuffs, flatus would just be like a fancy medical term for, for gas. You know, if you're passing gas or you've got a fart, then, you know, that what we'd be, we would have for, for flatus. Okay, so a few of these other words that we've already kind of looked at, this peristalsis, we've seen that, reflux, we've talked about that, um, stomas being an, an, oh, an opening or a hole. So again, if you've got a tracheostomy, stoma is the open hole. Likewise, if you've got the esophageal, or not the esophageal, the gastric tubes, um, you're going to have a stoma for that as well. Um, palpate just is a term meaning to feel. So if you palpate your pulse, that's, that's a form of palpation. If you palpate your carotid lymph nodes or your carotid arteries, if you're checking a pulse, then again, that's a, that's a type of palpation. And then we've looked at a lot of these abbreviations pretty much along the way when we've been going through the different types of words already. Um, but you can see some of the, the familiar ones like the UP cubed, I like to call it because it's got three Ps, GERD, the ERCP, um, A and P, GI just for gastrointestinal, irritable bowel syndrome, nausea, vomiting, PEG tubes. A lot of that uh, pretty, pretty common. All right, so that finishes up chapter 11.